Hello, and welcome to Dermatology Weekly, the official podcast of MDH Dermatology, where we discuss issues that most affect the specialty. I'm MDH editor Elizabeth Mishkati. And now, your host for this week's resident takeover, Dr. Sophie Greenberg. Welcome to this month's episode of Dermatology Weekly Resident Corner Takeover. I'm Dr. Sophie Greenberg, your host. Today, I'm interviewing Dr. Margaret Cox, who is a PGY3 resident at the University of Utah. She went to undergraduate at Yale and medical school at the University of Toronto, where she's from. Her column this month talks about the genital examination. Hi, Dr. Cox, and welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to talk about this area. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, so am I. I really liked your column, and you began by highlighting the surprising statistic that dermatology examinations tend to neglect the genital area. You even mentioned that female genitalia are examined even less frequently than the male genitalia. Can you tell us a little more about this? Sure, yeah. There there have been a few surveys that have looked at how dermatologists across the U.S. and abroad approach the total body skin exam. Um, and I think what's interesting about these surveys is that while we're taught sort of through our residency and even through med school um, that the skin exam um, includes sort of head to toe as well as the genital skin, um, most dermatologists don't actually look at uh, the genital skin in their daily practice. And you're right, the the other shocking thing is that female genitalia are even less likely to be examined than male genitalia. So there was a study not too long ago that surveyed 173 US and international dermatologists. um, And these people, these dermatologists who responded, um, only about slightly more than half said that they routinely examined the penis during their total body skin examination. And in contrast, only 28% routinely examined the labia majora. And there was an even more shocking study that found only 4% of dermatologists actually looked at the vulva during their total body skin examination. Um, And I think this is true for not only kind of attending dermatologists out in practice, but also residents. Um, There have been a couple of surveys that have looked at how residents do their total body skin examination. And one that was just published recently surveyed 121 U.S. residents and found that 23.3% of those residents either always or often looked at the genital region in male patients, while only 5% uh, reported examining the genital region always or often for female patients. Um, so it's, it's kind of surprising thinking about how this reasonably large area of the body is omitted in these exams and that female genitalia are even less likely to be looked at during a routine dermatologic visit. It's really shocking and just to remind us what are some of the most concerning as well as the most common dermatologic conditions that impact the genital area? Yeah I think the the big scary one that we think about is melanoma. And fortunately, this diagnosis is quite rare in the genital skin. And for vulvar melanomas, for example, they account for only about 2% of all melanomas in females. Um, Unfortunately, though, while this diagnosis is rare, a lot of the time when genital melanomas are identified, they're often found later at more aggressive stages, and patients generally tend to have worse prognosis. Um, And I think Partially, that might be because this area is not routinely examined by any care provider. Um, I think in addition to these big, bad, scary cancers that can happen in this area, there's also a lot of inflammatory conditions that affect the genital skin, and and I think we take for granted. And one of the big ones is psoriasis. Um, When I was putting this paper together, I came across one uh, interesting survey that found Uh, a staggering 60% of psoriasis patients who had genital involvement had never had this area examined by a physician. And what's more interesting about psoriasis, I think, is the literature teaches us that genital involvement is often more difficult to treat. So you could imagine that there's these patients 
with genital psoriasis who aren't being examined and aren't being treated because the rest of their body might be clear, but they have recalcitrant lesions in the genital area. Um, I think also one of the big ones that we see in, in genital skin um, are infectious diseases. And there's a lot of things that can happen in the, in the genital area. And some of the common ones are things like condyloma. And I think that could be missed on routine practice and also could be uh, pretty debilitating for affected patients. And I can imagine that patients might be embarrassed to ask for a genital exam if it's not offered to them. Yeah, and I think that's the, the big thing that, that also comes out of the literature. When you look at people who have had total body skin examinations before, and they've been through the whole process, they are by far more comfortable with the notion of the genital skin being included in the total body skin examination. Um, it's people who've not had a TBSE before that are more um, less that are less comfortable with the idea, and I think it's these patients that really uh, would benefit from a discussion as to what the total body skin examination includes. Um, and I think that would make them more comfortable with the idea that this is just part of what we do routinely. Yeah, normalizing it. Exactly. So what are some of the reasons that have been cited that dermatologists defer performing the genital examination? I think that question really touches on what we, what we briefly discussed, and that's patient comfort. Um, a lot of dermatologists cite patient discomfort and patient preference as the main reason why they don't include an exam of the genital skin in their routine practice. Other commonly cited reasons include time constraints. And I think one of the interesting papers I, I came across as well sort of looked at uh, the difference between male and female dermatologists and whether or not they include genital skin in their exam and found that women were more likely to examine genital skin, but were also spending more time with each patient and seeing less patients as a result. Um, so I, I think time constraints do play a role in, in real life practice. Um, I think another very surprising realization was that some dermatologists deferred the genital exam because they were under the impression that another provider, someone else like a gynecologist or a primary care provider was performing this exam um, and they didn't have to. That's actually interesting you mentioned that as it's come up in my um, personal family experiences where especially women, it's assumed that their gynecologist is examining them, but they're not specifically trained in genital cutaneous conditions. And after menopause, a lot of the time women stop going to the gynecologist, so they don't get the examination. So you're yeah. right. Yeah, so these women kind of fall into this no man's land. And I've often thought of just vulvar dermatology in general, um, you know, no pun intended, being a no man's land. And when, when all the uh, recommendations for screening sort of changed with pap smears becoming far less frequent than they were um, and cancer screening sort of shifting because of our ability to test for HPV and, and the HPV vaccine, um, these women are not being examined as frequently. Uh, and, and I don't think that's really caught up with the way that the dermatology and gynecology residency curriculum has kept pace, or it hasn't kept pace with those recommendations, rather. Um, and, th and that's a real shame because a lot of these inflammatory conditions like lichen sclerosis peak after uh, these women are no longer getting routine gynecologic care and, and they can be quite debilitating and, and have bigger risks down the road like squamous cell carcinoma and, and such. There was actually something related that I found surprising that you mentioned in your article about the training of dermatology residents in performing the skin examination, genital skin examination. Could you tell us a little bit more about how us residents are trained in doing this? So I think while the total body skin exam is kind of the foundation of the routine dermatologic visit. There isn't a lot of formalized training in this area. 
um, more generally, I think there, there just isn't. And the expectation is that you sort of learn by doing and you learn by practicing. Um, and so, you know, surprisingly, there's even less formalized training in the genital exam specifically. There was a, a, a survey, or there have been several of them, but one that looked at dermatology residents and uh, dermatology residents and program directors. Um, and this was an educational survey that was looking at how dermatology residents learn the total body skin examination. And this survey found that most training was by observation, as I just mentioned, and that, and there's a lot of sort of recall bias and whatnot, but a lot of the residents who were surveyed remembered the genital exam only being included in whatever they were learning about 40% of the time. I, I, that's a difficult stat to interpret, but there was a more uh, rigorous survey uh, that really did point to a, a gap in the curriculum. So this was looking at dermatology and OB-GYN residents. Um, and this survey found that on average, dermatology residents received about 3.24 hours per year of formal curriculum on vulvar skin disease, while the OB-GYN residents received 5.83 hours per year. Um, this same survey also observed that Dermatology residents estimated seeing about 34 patients with vulvar disease per year, while the OB-GYN residents saw about 14 of those patients per year. Um, and then most of the programs that they surveyed did not have access to a vulvar specialty clinic. Uh, so there's a lot of work to be done here. And as dermatologists, where we're seeing the majority of these patients, we are getting less formalized training in this area. It's really sad. And I think a major thing I'm gleaning from everything that you wrote about is that one reason we might be skipping this part of the exam is really a lack of comfort and having a hard time explaining to the patient why it's necessary or smoothly fitting it into our total body skin exam. So could you share with us some practical pearls about how to best perform the genital examination? Yes, I mean, this is something that I'm still working on. And uh, I feel like we talk about this as residents in my program um, in order to sort of learn from each other as well. Uh, but there are some helpful articles out there. There was this fantastic JAD CME that came out over the summer that looked at the female genital exam. And I think that really is a must read for all practicing dermatologists. Um, and just recently, CUTIS published a really great article on the male genital exam that provides some helpful hints. Um, and I think you really have to find something that works for you and sort of formalize it and do it every time. Uh, and then I, I think you're guaranteed more success in this area. Uh, I think the first step is to make sure your patient gets into a gown and, and I think that's such an obvious one, but I've walked into total body skin exams where people are fully clothed and it just becomes an entire ordeal to look at any part of skin, let alone um, the genital area. Um, and there's no consensus as to whether the undergarments have to stay on, but there was one study that found patients who kept their undergarments on were less likely to have their genitals examined. But I think this is something that you can talk through with your patient. And if they're more comfortable in keeping them on, I think it is okay to maneuver around um, undergarments to visualize the genital skin. And um, th there was a, a survey that did find some patients are more comfortable with, with keeping that on. And I, and I think that is uh, a conversation that is worth having with your patients. Patient comfort is definitely something important to maximize. For, for sure. And I think the realization is that providing patients with education as to what the total body skin exam includes, but also empowering them to make decisions as to what the total body skin exam looks like uh, in terms of details that increase comfort um, is also key. Yeah, normalizing it. And like you said, maybe if patients are more comfortable, not their first visit, but you could bring it up and then say, we'll do it at your second visit if you're not comfortable today, just to exactly them in their, the idea to them that it's normal and it should be offered. Do you find that there's a particular position that the patient should be in or a time in your exam that works the best 
for example, lying down when you're going head to toe, you make a pit stop in the genital area or do you sort of save it for last? Yeah, I have, uh, I think, I think that differs for male and female patients. So I think ideally female patients should be uh, supine for this exam just to better visualize the genital area. Uh, and I think it's easier to teach patients on how to properly apply medication when they're in a supine position, preferably with the help of a mirror so that they can visualize where certain medication needs to go if they're, for example, treating with topical steroids for lichen sclerosis. Um, in terms of the timing, I think it really depends on how you do your exam. I tend to prefer a head to toe approach and then sort of include that as I'm performing the, the total body skin exam itself. Um, but again, I think you really have to find a flow that, that works. In terms of male patients, I think they also can be involved with the decision whether, okay, so um, yeah, in terms of the male genital exam, uh, I have experienced that oftentimes it's easier to ask the patient whether they prefer sitting or being supine or standing. And generally I find a standing patient position is adequate for a, for a male genital skin exam. Um, but then, you know, again, I think you can gauge patient preference for this and sort of ideally make them as comfortable as possible. And I think just throughout it's, it's important to, uh, you know, use language that kind of normalizes this as part of the total body skin exam and, and uses anatomical verbiage as opposed to colloquialisms just to keep it a, a professional and, and medical environment. Yeah, I agree. That sounds very consistent with my experience as well. Um, and so on that note, when is it recommended that a chaperone be present during the genital examination in adult patients? Should one be offered just when examining the office, opposite gender or for all patients? I think the natural inclination is to always have a chaperone present for these sensitive exams, but the data doesn't 100% support that this makes patients more comfortable or most comfortable during a genital skin exam. In fact, patients tend to prefer to have fewer patients in the room during these examinations. At least that's what some of the literature suggests. Although I think it should be noted that it is often helpful to have a chaperone present for providing medical legal protection for the provider. Um, I think the big takeaway really is to always offer a chaperone regardless of patient gender and allow the patient to make that decision uh, unless there's a, some, a protocol where you're practicing um, that a chaperone always needs to be present, which sometimes is the case. That sounds reasonable and very wise. Um, and do you have other recommendations for patient education regarding the genital examination? I think education is really the key and that's kind of the common thread of, uh, of making the total body skin exam or facilitating genital examination as part of the total body skin exam. Um, telling the patient that this will include an examination of the genital skin is key. Discussing that skin diseases like skin cancers, inflammatory rashes, infections, and so on can involve the genital skin is key to this approach as well. I think ultimately we need to empower patients to make decisions on how the skin exam is performed as well so that they are comfortable with it being included as part of their routine visit also. And I think now with um, electronic health records and just so many opportunities to interact with patients, it makes it easier for us to share this kind of information with them and prepare them for what, what a visit to the dermatologist looks like. And that includes um, an examination of the genital skin. So it's really something that we can take advantage of and improve patient care uh, by just giving our patients more information, educating them about what it means to see the dermatologist. That's true, like providing information in, in advance of their first visit about what they might expect 
that they are expected to get into a gown for their first visit with us. Um, and I think really one thing that I took home from talking to you and reading your article is that making sure a provider is very comfortable at doing the genital exam, focusing on learning the way that is best for you to do it while you're a resident and learning how to normalize it for your patient. I also love the resources you mentioned, like the JAD CME on how to do a female genital examination and the recent CUTIS article on a male exam. Do you have any other resources or words of wisdom in residents interested in becoming comfortable and competent in evaluating genital skin and disease? I think our greatest resource as trainees are the people we learn from our attendings. I found it immensely helpful to ask my attendings on how they do their skin exam. And I want to know how they go from head to toe, what their sequence is, how they position the patient. And I also have been picking their brains about how they incorporate the genital exam within their framework and try and gauge what works for them and see how it might work for me. I think this does take practice and it's a skill that we strive to become really good at. Um, so it's okay to, to sort of practice different ways of approaching it and finding one that works for you. I think ultimately sticking with that approach ensures the best care for all of our patients. So utilizing the know-how of our attendings and trying to see how, how their approach might work for us is, a, is, a, is an invaluable resource that all of us have access to. That was awesome. Thank you so much for sharing all of this amazing, helpful information with us. I look forward to reading the rest of your columns this year and to our interviews together. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed chatting with you. Thank you. Take care. That's it for this week's episode of Dermatology Weekly. The peer-to-peer -peer portion of the show is produced by MD Edge editor Melissa Sears and editor Alicia Saunders. All of our podcasts are produced by an MD Edge editor, Kathy Scarbeck. I'm MD Edge editor Elizabeth Mishkati, and this is Dermatology Weekly.